Help us, Lord, to be still and know that you are alone, our God. Let us quiet ourselves in preparation for worship. Thank you, Carol. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship. Our desire is to be warm and friendly. Let's reach out to one another in Christian love as we worship and have fellowship with one another. Good morning. morning. You are greeted this morning by Millie Peppel. Speaking of Millie, since she's part of the mission committee meeting there you have a meeting at 11 o'clock on wednesday and in the afternoon we have a movie being shown here at the church downstairs in the fellowship hall at four o'clock there will be popcorn and it is pay it forward and so if you're able to come at that time to enjoy is it what two hours hour two hours then you still can get home for supper or go out for dinner Mm. Okay, and then, of course, she's already highlighted the Saturday. Are there any other announcements? We're glad for the faithful that have come out today. Our gathering hymn is Be Known to Us in Breaking Bread, 500 in Glory to God.
please join me in the responsive call to worship. We come together to observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We come together to praise God with festive songs and shouts of joy. We come together to hear the voice of our Savior calling us to compassion. We come together to experience the abundance of God's grace. Renew us by your spirit, Lord. Let us worship God with our hymn of praise. Number 667, in glory to God when morning gilds the skies. <laughs> of busy lives, our time of confession gives us the opportunity to pause and reflect on how we spend our time. Have we loved others? Have we spent energy on what is life-giving for us and others? Christ invites us to bring our best and worst to him in prayer, that he might offer us his healing and his peace. Let us pray. Lord of life, you call us to rest, but we are too busy. You call us to offer rest to others, but we are too demanding. You call us to remember that you are always at work in our lives, but we are distracted by worry. Forgive our constant striving and obsession with work. Remind us that our value comes from you, not from our productivity. Teach us the rhythms of your grace and grant us renewal, forgiveness, and peace. Amen. Please join me in the response of assurance of God's grace. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. I don't see any children. So, Sherry, save that for another Sunday, okay? Sherry was going to do that. 
We are so grateful to have Dina, Reverend Dina Candler from Omaha to speak with us today. She was, uh, is retired, not old enough, does she, doesn't look it, does she? And she uh, was at the West Hills Presbyterian Church in, Shed in Omaha, and that's where Rick's family all went. She was a wonderful caregiver to the congregation, and she also spoke at Rick's mother's funeral. So we've known her a little bit, and so thank you so much for coming. She can tell you more about herself if she cares to. Well, thank you. I'm so glad to be here today on this important uh, transition time for this church. And uh, I hope for Rick that his retirement is as wonderful for him as it has been for me. I've uh, spent some time doing pulpit supply, and I've gone on a board for the Outreach Foundation, which partners with Presbyterian churches here and in 42 countries and I travel with them to places like Egypt and the Holy Land and Cuba and Mexico. And it's fun to see what God is doing in the world. And I have a wonderful therapy dog who uh, loves to go and visit kids at preschools and things like that and who uh, keeps me sane. She teaches me a lot. So I'm really grateful to be here today with you. I was a little concerned about a week ago when I was uh, driving one day in Omaha and had the radio on, and lo and behold, there was this wonderful uh, story about Rick. And I learned some things about Rick that I didn't know. My only concern was when uh, they said, they gave his background and said that he'd graduated from Dubuque Cemetery. And I thought, well, wow, that, that doesn't happen a lot, you know? Uh, so uh, I thought Rick would appreciate that, knowing the wonderful humor that he has. So uh, this more, as I was praying for all of you and for Rick and asking God, what should we consider this morning in our message? And what came to me is that this is a time of transition for this church uh, as we're, we're always in transition, but sometimes it's more apparent than others. And so uh, one of the great transitions we find in Scripture is right after Moses died, and the people have not yet gotten into the land God had promised so many years before. And so this morning we are going to look at that transition in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And as kind of a background to it, these people had uh, been enslaved in Egypt after living there for 400 years, and God had called Moses to lead them out, and then they spent another 40 years wandering around in the desert. And now after all of that time, Moses has died, and the baton has been passed to Joshua to lead them in. And these are the words of Joshua to that community just prior to their entering in. So let's listen to the word of God. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am going to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips, Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. 
Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, what do you do after Moses? Moses was that amazing leader in the Old Testament who led the Hebrew people out of Egypt where they had been enslaved. He led them for 40 years in the wilderness. But he would not be the one who would eventually lead them into that land that God had promised so many centuries earlier. That responsibility would fall to Joshua. It's a transition time for them. Time of change, not just in leadership, but also in place in a new land. But I think sometimes land doesn't have to do just with geography. Land also has to do with what it is we're being called to into something different. And so perhaps there's some similarities for us. What are we to know about what it means to be a follower of God from these words that we hear in Joshua 1? The day came about that it was time before Moses had died for these people to go and check out the land. And so Moses got a group of 12 spies to go and search it out. We read this in the book of Numbers. And when those 12 went, even though they had been through so much in Egypt, when they finally began to a, came to a spot where they could oversee the land God had promised before them, their response was this when they came back to Moses. We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. And they said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, really tall people, kind of like uh, Caitlin Clark. We seemed like grasshoppers in our eyes, and, they, and we looked the same to them. This is what we read in the book of Numbers. And the only two of those 12 spies who said, no, we can, we can do it, this is what God has called us to do, were Joshua and Caleb. And at this point, God had had enough. And so he said, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hands to be your home except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. This is why the Hebrew people were in the wilderness for 40 years. They weren't ready to enter the land that God had promised. They weren't ready internally to enter the land. Now, it was a long trek for them, but really it's only about 380 miles And it's about the distance from here to Nebraska. I was telling my hornbuckle relative down here, I'm a hornbuckle too in background, that my great-grandmother made the trek from Missouri to Colorado with her husband and kids in 42 days in covered wagon. Doesn't take that long. And yet here they are for 40 years in this wilderness. Why? because they didn't have the inner fortitude that they were going to need for what it was God was calling them to do. In fact, there was actually a rebellion going on at this point in which some of the people wanted to select a new leader to take them back to Egypt, back where they'd been enslaved. Why in the world would they do that? Well, the reason is that Many of us are more comfortable with what we know, even if it's bad. 
We're more comfortable with that than we are stepping into the unknown that hopefully is going to be a whole lot better. It's the reason why some people have such a hard time breaking away from addictions because at least that's the known in their life. And we've got our own issues with that as well. And it's why sometimes we turn back to doing things the way they've always been done. How, how many times have you heard that phrase somewhere? We've always done it that way. But God calls us today, as we saw in Joshua and Caleb, to trust God for the big challenges, even when we don't know all that it entails. And we do it because we believe that God is with us. So if part of what it means for us to follow God in transition is to face up to challenges, it also involves us being people who are strong and courageous. I have a, a small little compact Bible that I take with me when I'm traveling. It's got everything in there. I need some readers these days to read the fine print. And it's gone with other people, too, when they travel overseas and want to keep their luggage light and they want to take the Bible with them. I've written in the front cover all of the places it's gone over the years. It's been in four continents. But the very first time, the very first trip, was when I flew to Honduras to adopt my son. And as I made that trek on the airplane... I read this passage from Joshua 1 over and over again because I realized I was going to need to be strong and courageous. And it wasn't just about going to the new land, the new country of Honduras. It was also about the new land in my life where I was going to be, need to be strong and courageous as I became a single parent of that baby. We need strength and courage for lots of things. When the time finally came for Joshua to lead the people into that land that God had promised, there was a real need for courage. And there would be times in which God's chosen people would fail in standing firm as they needed to. And that same kind of courage is needed still today for you and me as God's followers. We need courage because it's hard to live out our faith in the midst of a post-Christian culture in which we are a minority. And most of us find it uncomfortable to be in the minority, no matter how important an issue is to us. It's difficult for us to be in the minority in our surrounding culture. And increasingly, we're going to find that there will be times when the values that we have because of belonging to Jesus Christ do put us in the minority. And for most of us, that is an uncomfortable position. In order to be true to Christ, we must be strong and courageous. We need courage because the way of Christ is a narrow way. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to God but through me. We live in an age of tolerance, in which many wish to say there are many ways that are right. But Christ has said that his way is narrow and that it is the only way. And that can make us uncomfortable because we live in a culture in which a predominant value is believing that all ways and all truths are valid. We need, cult we need courage to be more faithful to God than to what we perceive to be pleasing to people. Far too often, some of us are more concerned with what other people think than what God thinks. And we go out of our way not to upset others or to make them unhappy. And most of the time for us, it doesn't involve a denial of our faith outright. But it does take us making decisions at times that may not be entirely pleasing to God. We need courage to step out and use the gifts that God has given us. There's so many reasons we don't want to do that. We fear failure and the judgment of others. We feel inadequate 
And we sometimes are sure there must be others who are more capable of doing this thing than I am. It takes great courage for people to step out and use the gifts that God has given them. It takes courage as a church of transition to be looking ahead faithfully to where it is that God is leading us to something new and believing he is in the plan. We need courage because the decision to be faithful and following is not a one-time decision. People sometimes make the mistake in thinking that courage means the opposite of fear and that it is simply a given in a person's life. That's not true. Courage is acting in faith despite fear, in the midst of fear. And it is something that we do not just act on once, but we do it again and again and again. I have a a framed saying on my desk at home that says this, courage does not always roar. Sometimes it's the quiet voice that whispers, I'll try again tomorrow. That's what it is. It's the not giving up, even when it feels like we failed, but saying, I'll try again tomorrow. Followers of God, we also find here, are grounded in God's word. So many people tell me they want to hear from God, but he seems so silent. And they're frustrated. The wonder is that God has spoken. He's spoken. It's right here. It's in the Bible. Sometimes on Sunday mornings when we read the scripture, I'm astonished that we aren't more astonished. What if we were to understand it this way? That when the person, whoever reads scripture, the lay leader or the pastor, was to stand up and say, guess what? We have a word from the Lord. Don't you want to hear what he says? I mean, shouldn't we be so excited to know what he has to say to us? He's speaking to us. You know, on those rare days anymore, when I go out to the mailbox and there's a a real letter, not just the junk mail that comes every day, but a real letter from a friend. I am so excited to open it up and read what it is they have to say. And you know, it should be exactly our response about this book. Because what we have here is not junk mail. Oh no, it's a love letter from our best friend. And it's precisely what it is we find God reminding Joshua of in that transition. In verse 8, in chapter 1, he says this, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. It's not junk mail. And we need to spend time in it every day. I believe that the most pressing issue facing the church in this country these days is biblical illiteracy. That we don't know what it is that God has to say. Time and time again, the Bible is the best-selling book in the country. It doesn't appear anymore on the list because it's just redundant. And never had we had it more available to us in print, in so many different translations, in, um, in our, our tablets, in our cell phones, uh, even in apps where it will read it out loud to us. In one of my trips with the Outreach Foundation, when we were meeting with partners in the Holy Land, we met with the Palestinian Bible Society. They have solar Bibles 
solar Bibles that read the scriptures out loud in Arabic for Arabic speakers who may be illiterate. Is that astounding? The word has never been more available. And yet, how often do we treat it that way and spend time there? Because if we don't, we can't interpret really the events and decisions that are, need to be made around us through the lens of Scripture. Instead, too often we do it vice versa. How many of you here today have been ordained as a deacon or an elder in this or any church? How many? Oh, a lot. When you are ordained, as Rick and I were, there are nine questions you have to answer. And when I did ordinations of our deacons and elders, I always said these questions are easy to answer. They're all I do or I will. But they're harder to live out. And one of those questions is this. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? When we answer that question in the affirmative and claim that the scriptures are authoritative, It means that they are a source of truth for decision-making. But it's not just for leaders. It's not just for deacons and elders and pastors. It is for any of us who are called to be a follower of God. Because it means that our source of truth for decision-making is to be found there. And we have no way of determining it unless we know what God has to say to us. And otherwise, you're going to have a lot of pastors here in the weeks to come. And you're not going to know if what they're saying is malarkey or not. And I say that even of myself. That we should, each of us, be able to determine from what we know in Scripture ourselves about what is true about God's Word. We need to be critical thinkers about our faith. And so my challenge to you today is that if you don't know this book, it's time to start. Because what you'll find is a love letter. And you can read through the entire Bible in a year simply by reading three chapters a day. Ten minutes in the morning or before you go to bed. Two chapters in the Old Testament, one in the New. And what you will find is wisdom and love for good decisions in life that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Otherwise, it's like my mechanic trying to fix my car with no understanding about engines whatsoever. And finally, there's this. Followers of God have to make a choice. And the most basic choice we make every day is whether we're going to serve God or not. At the end of the book of Joshua, we've read the very beginning in chapter 1, and then at the end of the book, chapter 24, the land has basically been settled. And all of the Hebrew people have moved in there and have overcome their enemies. There have been times in the midst of that in which they were tempted to turn to other things for their trust. And so because of that, Joshua puts one last challenge before them. In chapter 24, verse 15, he says, If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I have in my kitchen a crock with that verse on it. You know, I keep my spatulas and spoons and things like that. And every day when I'm in the kitchen, I'm reminded that I'm being called to choose. 
It's not just a one-time thing when I first made a commitment to Jesus Christ. It's an everyday choice. And every day, it's the choice between every, before every one of us. Am I going to obey him today? Or am I going to, am I going to choose him or something or someone else or just or choose myself and put myself in the idle chair? Am I going to serve him today? Choose this day. But as for me and my house, we will choose the Lord. Let us be people who choose him. Let us be a church that chooses him. No matter where he may lead us, let's choose the Lord. Because he is the only one who will lead us to life and to joy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is our privilege as people who choose the Lord to be invited to his table. Because that's what family and loved ones do together. And this is his table. So he is the one who gives the invitation. And it is an open table. He invites everyone who is truly sorry for their sin and who long to be alive to him to come and to celebrate this meal in his name. Let's join together in our invitation to the table. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I invite the elders who are serving to come forward and invite you to come to the table that has been prepared for you. Let's pray together. Loving God, you have given us a share in the bread and the one cup and made us one with Christ. Help us to bring your salvation and joy to all the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Oh, gracious and loving God, we are thankful for so much you have provided for so many things in our lives, for employment and homes that are comfortable, for 
food that is on our plates every day, for friendship, for families, and for this body of Christ that gathers here. We are so grateful. Lord, even as we come with our thanksgivings before you, we also come with our requests and our concerns. We pray for those that we know who are infirm in body, who need your healing touch. We pray that you would grant them that, O oh God, but we pray even more that you would help them to know and to feel your presence with them, no matter what they go through. We pray for those who are dealing with illnesses we cannot see, or for mental illness, who suffer from depression and for other concerns. We pray that you would walk beside them as well, O oh God. And for those who battle addictions, we pray, O oh God, that you would break the chains that hold them, and, and open them up to new freedoms in their lives. Lord, for these things, we often see faces of those we know, but we know that your children are spread throughout this whole world and that you love each of them dearly. And so we pray for those in difficult places these days who need your healing as they deal with issues of war, Today, we especially pray for your, your brother, our brothers and sisters in Gaza who are going through atrocities we cannot imagine. We boldly pray, O oh God, that you would bring the peace that can only come from you in that place, and that for those Christians who are there, that they might somehow be beacons of courage and hope in a place where so much feels hopeless. And Lord, we pray that as well for those in Ukraine who are dealing with war in that country as well. And again, we boldly pray for peace, but we also pray that as you are with the church in that country, that they might boldly profess the light and hope that comes from you. All of these things we know we can ask only because of Jesus who loved us, who gave his life for us, and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is our privilege as God's people to receive from him every day of our lives. And it is also our privilege to be a part of his kingdom as we give. So let us now offer our tithes and our gifts to the Lord.
Let us pray. Oh Lord, these gifts are but a token of all that we are and all that we have. Help us to be both wise and generous stewards and use these gifts to the end that others might come to know and feel the love of Christ. It is in his name that we ask it. Amen. Let's join together in our last hymn, number 694. As we go from this place, we remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We make time to savor God's creation, to rest from worry and work, and bask in the goodness of all God's gifts to us. And remember that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you go.